why did continuous profiling need a new database? That's what I wanted to talk about uh, today. And before I even jump, jump into the database part, I want to clarify what continuous profiling is because I think it's still kind of an up and coming thing. Um, but before we talk about continuous profiling, let's actually just talk about profiling. So uh, profiling is kind of as old as programming itself. So when we did our uh, research, we found that uh, there were profilers literally written in the 1960s and 1970s, basically whenever um, you know, software engineering started to become um, uh, like a widely adopted profession um, because Ever since programming was a thing, we needed to understand where were resources being spent? Where do, am I spending my CPU? Where am I spending my um, memory? And so on, right? Um, it can really be applied to any resource or anything that you can quantify. And um, the way that profiling data is typically um, represented is that we have a stack trace. So here I'm slightly simplifying, but basically we have um, our stack of functions, right? So main, function one, function two, function, main calling function one, function one calling function two. And we saw this function um, being, two seconds being spent in this function, right? And with this kind of data, we can then create statistics that are helpful for us humans to understand where our resources being spent, where can I um, kind of take an action and improve my program. And so in this kind of very simplified example, we've got 80% of our time being spent in function three um, and 20% uh, being spent in function two. And all of them are being called from main and function one. So clearly, you know, Function three is the thing that we should have a look at uh, to potentially optimize. And continuous profiling uh, is kind of taking profiling, which is typically done on kind of an on-demand basis, right? We go, we take a profile of our program over a 10 second period of time, for example, um, and that's kind of it. And we have a representation of our program and what our program is doing over those exact 10 seconds um, in time. And that's great if those 10 seconds are actually representative for your entire program, right? Um, and continuous profiling kind of um, takes the same kind of approach where that monitoring did like in the end of the 2000s, beginning of the um, like 2010s, where we went from doing checks, right? Like Nagios checks, if you may remember that. Um, where we took that and made it into time series. So we have data that we're collecting over time, and then we can do much more sophisticated alerting. If you're maybe familiar with Prometheus, that's exactly what Prometheus is doing, alerting on time series data. And con continuous profiling is basically applying that same methodology that we can continuously collect profiling data throughout time. And this was kind of first described by Google in a paper that was published around 2010. Um, and they described how they were always profiling their entire infrastructure, all their data centers, all the time. And it's kind of a classic data problem where if you don't have the data, you don't know what to do, right? Like that's kind of, doesn't just apply to monitoring or observability, it kind of applies to anything. If you don't have data, you're just kind of poking in the dark. Um, and so, yeah, the, the point of continuous profiling is that we don't only have the snapshot of one point in time, but that we have representative data throughout time. And that means when we have that kind of data and we optimize um, based on that data, we're actually optimizing our process for the entire lifetime of the process, as opposed to just that one little glimpse that we, um, that we got. So we, we looked at, um, profiling data, now what does continuous profiling data kind of in theory look like, right? We still have our stack traces, um, and then we have what we added essentially is the time axis, right? So not only do we have one um, point in time, but we're looking at multiple points in time and where uh, kind of the measurements that are happening there. And one, like, obviously this is made up data, excuse me, but um, something that you can already see is that Obviously, because of how programs work, we're not always observing the same stack traces. We're not even seeing anything, uh, any, the data is not even similar necessarily across points in time. And that's why continuous profiling is important so that we get a statistically sound representation of our program over all of time. 
And so that's, that's why individual profiles are actually um, comparatively uninteresting. I'm just going to cycle through a couple of um, kind of data points and we'll uh, kind of have a demo later. But these individually kind of are sort of boring and they're not particularly representative over the entire point in time. We can see, right, like the CPU time keeps jumping and it keeps doing different things because that's just what programs do, right? Um, but the point is when we take all of this data and now combine it into a single representation, now this is actually representative of our program throughout time, right? If I now, if I'm able to um, optimize something in this entire stack, it means I'm actually optimizing like 50% of my CPU time that is being spent in my entire data center, right? So what we're, what we're looking at here is not just profiling data of a single process, but profiling data of all processes in my, all my data centers combined, right? So this is actually something that helps us save cost because we can, we have some, something that's statistically significant in terms of the CPU time that's being spent. And at this point, you know, people start saying, okay, all of this sounds pretty great, but whenever I think of profiling, I think of super high overhead, um, uh, like a super high overhead thing, and that's why, why we only do it um, on demand. And um, that's not wrong, but um, there are a couple of tricks that we can apply to make it super low overhead. Um, and most of the time, at least with CPU profilers, we do, we do something called sampling profiling. So in theory, the way we can think about it is we look X amount of times per second, we look at the current stack, right? Um, and based on that, we can kind of infer, because we know which functions um, are in that stack trace at that point in time, we can infer how much time is being spent, right? It's all statistics. Um, and because it's sampling, we can control the sampling rate, how often we're actually looking at it, and depending on, on how high that frequency is, that's how much um, overhead we incur. And so um, what we're working on essentially ended up being a profiler that has about 1% in overhead, but we find that most organizations are able to opti easily optimize 20 to 30% of their CPU time. So, you know, go figure, that definitely makes sense for most organizations uh, to do. But, you know, this is not, it's easy to put this on a slide. Um, this is very, very difficult engineering work. Um, and in part, uh, the, way, the way we make this work, and there are many other talks about this, uh, but the way we make this work essentially is using eBPF uh, to collect this data um, and kind of really only collecting the data we truly need in kernel space, kind of aggregating it there, and then only every 10 seconds actually uh, grabbing this data, and that's what, how we're effectively able to um, to do this at super low overhead. Now, um, I kind of so far I've only talked about uh, continuous profiling data as in profiling data um, over time, right? Something that uh, we wanted to do is that we can aggregate profiling data across any axis. If you're pr familiar with Prometheus, this probably looks very familiar. So we have kind of a query language where we first differentiate in the type of profile that we're looking for, and then we can have arbitrary labels that kind of slice and dice our infrastructure. So region is an, uh, is an interesting one, or you know, it can be anything. Maybe in Kubernetes it's namespace, pod, container, node, anything that's useful to you and how you and your organization organize your infrastructure is completely configurable. Um, now, again, in, in theory, this is really nice, and it's nice to say this, right? But this uh, takes a lot of engineering effort uh, to make this work. And I just want to show you a very quick demo that, you know, this does actually work. Um, so we have a, a demo instance on demo.parka.dev uh, where you can try this out. So we have some profiling data here. Bigger, sorry. Can people in the back see that as well? Okay, so basically what I did is I selected, I wanna see CPU samples um, and I hit search and now we can see kind of the CPU uh, time that's being spent um, over time and we can click an individual sample and we'll get the um, flame graph 
for that particular point in time. And as I said, um, we can kind of slice and dice this. So if you just wanted to see the Parker container, for example, or if we you know, just want to see a particular um, area, or um, we, can, we, we can kind of dive in and find exactly the data that we're looking for. We can slice and dice it by the container, uh, by, the, by the labels. And then finally, we can actually also merge all of this data across time, right? So what we're now looking at is not just a point in time of the container, but the entire CPU time that was being spent throughout this time frame, right? And I, I, won't, I won't go into too much more detail, but um, there's lots of other features um, where we can kind of compare different points in time. So I can click this sample, whoops, um, and this sample, and then we should see the difference. Well, maybe it'll still load, but essentially um, what we should be seeing is a flame graph that um, looks kind of similar to what we had before, but it is colored indicating whether something got better or worse, right? So green indicating that I'm spending less CPU time somewhere, red and the, depending on the shade of red, um, kind of how much worse it got. Uh, maybe we can try this again later. Uh, maybe we got more luck with the, luck with the demo gods then. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the point of why we want to do continuous profiling. There's so much possibility and I won't go dive into too many things, but the thing that I wanted to show at the end, comparing um, is super interesting when you, for example, roll out a new piece of, a new version of software, right? You kind of all of a sudden have a surge in latency or something and you want to know why, right? Previously, we kind of, maybe we looked at the Git diff and we can maybe try to understand what's happening, but with this, we actually down to the line number can tell you where things got worse, right? With statistic significance. And so just kind of doing a back of the envelope math, and I won't go through all of these uh, numbers in particular, but if we're looking at 100 stacks per second, um, and that's per host that we're looking at, then we're, we're talking about, um, if we're, if we're looking at a thousand hosts, you know, relatively large Kubernetes cluster, but definitely the kind of size that we want to be able to deal with, um, then we're dealing with 10, 10 billion samples per day that we want to be able to slice and dice on any dimension at you know, reasonable latency. So this is a pretty difficult data problem to solve to do at kind of real time. So when we kind of started to uh, work on this, we we did a bunch of experiments with existing databases. Um, and you know, we wrote an entire blog post with all of the kind of things that we explored and all of the things we failed at. Um, so if you're interested in all of that, go to our blog. Um, here I'll just kind of talk you through the thing that actually ended up working for us. And what we ended up going with is a columnar database. And, and you know, as the talk title suggested, we actually, actually built one ourselves. So let's go kind of and look at the problem that we're trying to solve if we think about all of this data as you know, tabular data. So we have our labels that are you know, um, dynamic, right? We don't necessarily know the labels that are gonna um, occur up front. That just needs to happen as the labels trickle in. And the rest is kind of the same as we were looking at before. We have our stack traces. We have our timestamps and the values, um, kind of the occurrences. How often have we seen the stack trace um, at this at this uh, timestamp? So that's kind of that was just the logical layout. And the reason why for us a columnar layout actually ended up um, working out super well is because we can kind of exploit the locality of data being stored by columns rather than by rows. So that's essentially what makes a columnar database. Typically, most relational databases, they store all of the data belonging to a row physically on disk together. In a columnar database, we store all of the, da all of the data points of a column all after each other. And so CPUs are particularly good at uh, sequentially kind of working through data that, is, um, that has cache locality, right? Like basically the CPU ends up loading a bunch of these things at once into CPU cache and then can immediately kind of um, process that. And there's a bunch of 
CPU tricks that you can apply to these um, with, with a characteristic like that. So for us, that ended up working out really well, at least in theory. <laughs> um, but it took a bunch of uh, really hard work to actually make this work. And once again, we, we realized that the characteristics of a columnar database were probably going to be really good for us. But um, of course, you know, I, I don't know how many people have built a database, but um, that's, it's hard. It's a lot of work. And you know, ideally, we would be focusing on the continuous profiling bits and kind of creating a product rather than creating foundational um, infrastructure pieces. So we looked at existing columnar databases, but the problem was we had this label data that was variable in, um, in their keys, right? We didn't know the kind of keys that were gonna occur and the best kind of data type that existing columnar databases had, we looked at uh, ClickHouse, we looked at DuckDB, we looked at a couple of other ones. Um, the one that came closest for us was InfluxDB IOX. However, unfortunately, we talked to the maintainers and they said it was not going to be ready for us to be used in time. Um, if you're interested in any of like database stuff, absolutely check out InfluxDB IOX. They're doing some really incredible stuff, uh, but just it wasn't gonna align with our timeline. But they were super um, open with their experience and they shared a bunch of their um, kind of experiments that they did and directions. And so that informed a lot of our decisions. But basically, the only thing that existing um, columnar databases had were map types. So we could store the labels as maps, but this had exactly the same problem that we had with the relational database. We need to be able to kind of iterate through this data all at once, right? And if we store a map, we're still gonna be loading all of this data, even if we're not interested in it. So even though we're now going into a columnar database, we still would end up with the kind of characteristics of a relational database that is row-based. So that wasn't gonna work for us, we realized. Um, and for um, compression to be um, optimal, if we go back, kind of uh, looking, at, um, looking at this data, we could also, not only could we exploit that this data is kind of all um, in memory, kind of one after each other, because it's like that, we can kind of exploit repetition and things like that to say things like, okay, I have six times the same value coming up now. Uh, I have it two times or all of these kinds of things. And there are lots of different kind of compression mechanisms that we can apply here to not only you know, make it fast to be processed at query time, but also efficient to store in memory and on disk. And so we realized after looking around for a very, very long time that we were just gonna have to build it. Um, and the first kind of problem, as I said, that absolutely no database out there was gonna be able to provide us with is kind of this notion of dynamic columns. Something that kind of has sort of a schema, right? We know that the values of this stuff is gonna be strings, but we don't know the actual columns that are gonna be needed up front. So it needed to automatically kind of dynamically create them as we see them for the first time. So that was kind of um, requirement number one. Um, and I was talking about the, the ability to exploit like repetition and things like that for compression to be um, optimal. And for that to work, we were gonna have to also sort all of our data globally through basically all of the data that we have needs to be sorted so that we can actually um, reach reasonable compression. And it kind of has an interesting or a really amazing side effect as well when data is um, sorted, we won't need an index um, for all of this data to be able to do a binary search to find the kind of data that we're interested in when we do a query, right? So it has so many benefits um, that we felt like this was worth um, investigating how we could do this. So the way that we end up maintaining global sorting in our database is that we have something that we call a granule and a granule essentially has an upper, um, a lower and an upper uh, range, right? And we say everything in this granule 
is within this range. And so every time we insert new data, we essentially split up the data and we insert it into the appropriate granule. And that's how we um, globally maintain sorting. And there are a bunch of tricks in here how doing these inserts um, is actually can be done, can be achieved in a uh, in a cheap way. And it all kind of boils down to that all data is always sorted, whether it's the data that's inserted um, or this, the data that's held in memory or the data that's on disk. Just kind of the sorting is maintained throughout the entire lifetime of data. And um, the, the granule, in order to be able to, you know, I, I was talking about using binary search to jump to places so that queries could be efficient. Um, in order to kind of maintain that property over time as we insert more and more data, we need to also split these granules so that we continue to have the like granularity to jump to actually the right place and not iterate over a bunch of unnecessary data. Because you know we could start with four granules, but that's kind of pointless because we'll end up going into a granule. Um, and then if we have you know a hundred billion um, samples, then we're still gonna end up iterating over 20, 25 billion. So that's that's not really winning anything. So that's why we needed to create a mechanism to when we reach a certain granule size, also split it, and then we um, insert it into this, what we call a sparse index, which essentially only has the upper and lower bounds so that we have a like, order of magnitude smaller space to search through. And in reality, um, a granule is actually um, not sorted in itself, even though I kind of made it look like that, right? I said that um, like five, six, seven here, um, that these are sorted in themselves, but actually what happens is that we only, um, we only respect the upper and lower bound, and within that granule, um, we just keep adding the parts, and eventually when we do the splitting, we actually merge them and put them into the sorted order, and so you know, eventually everything is actually globally sorted, but it depends on the type of query that we're doing, whether we actually end up sorting it at query time, because most uh, queries don't actually require um, require sorting, except for when we do the, you saw earlier we were querying over time, right? That's the kind of query that definitely needs sorting because we as humans want to see the sorted data. But when we were looking at the flame graph, for example, all we're doing is taking all of the values and just kind of crushing them together by uh, stack trace. Um, so that kind of query doesn't require sorting, and yeah, sorting is relatively expensive when you do it over you know, hundreds of billions um, values. So yeah, and then the very last thing, um, to make all of this safe, right, or you know, safety is a spectrum um, in software engineering, but um, in order to be able to only see um, certain pieces of data and don't see like what we call um, like ripped writes. Uh, so what that means is if we insert, let's say a batch of 10,000 rows, we want to only see um, all of those rows at once at query time, not, you know, maybe 2,000 of those rows. It's a classic kind of database problem that you need to solve so that things like alerting and reporting is actually accurate. Um, otherwise, you can get confusing data when, you know, you insert 10,000 rows and you end up getting 2,000 rows out. So we have a mechanism um, that ends up giving us snapshot isolation, um, if you're familiar with the term. But what, essentially what that means is that at a point in time that you're reading, you're definitely getting a cons consistent view um, of the data. And the, the way that we achieve this, because um, the database that we wrote is an, a, a write-only database, so we can never modify data. That's also particularly important for sorting, right? If we were able to kind of change the value of a label, for example, that would mean um, that we're now changing the sorting of this row um, in, the, in the data globally, and that's something that cannot happen. And that's why one of the reasons why this database is a write-only database. But essentially what we're doing is we're inserting all of the parts that we saw, right? We, we, we had the, have the granules and we have parts in the granule. And the parts themselves have a transaction ID 
um, attached to them. And then what we do is we expect all transactions to linearly be uh, made available. And essentially a lower transaction can always block a higher transaction. Um, and only if we make linear progress do we actually make progress. And again, there are a bunch of tricks to actually make this safe because as you can probably imagine, if we do something like that, that means that if there's one transaction that's forever blocking, it means we'll never make progress. It's one of those things that um, while um, theoretically this means that we have snapshot isolation, you know, in practice it doesn't actually work. But the way we make this work is that just every transaction has a timeout and so eventually we'll always make progress. But the point of everything that I said in this slide is that it's safe to read data back from this database <laughs> if you, you know, didn't care about any of the other stuff that I said. So yeah, we built all of this for the, uh, the open source continuous profiling project that we maintain called Parka. And we just last week released this as part of version 0 0.11. And um, yeah, so what's next for, for all of this? Actually, right now, this database is entirely in memory, although we have a couple of experiments of flushing this data to disk. Um, it's, of course, everyone wants data over time, and we do as well. It's just, you know, the, the development of a database takes time and uh, we just haven't gotten to it. And then the kind of next step is that um, not only do we want to persist it, but we also specifically designed all of this to work super well with object storage. And I could give another, an, an entire, uh, another talk about why object storage is a good choice here, but essentially it allows us to treat storage as infinite, right? And we made a bunch of design decisions uh, that allows us to um, you know, optimize this for uh, object storage. So yeah, that's it. Thank you uh, for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm be super happy to answer those now, but we also uh, separately open source this database under uh, our PolarSignals.org ArcticDB. Um, yeah, thank you for listening.